Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're listening to this broadcast at and whenever you're listening to it. This is Pastor David Trainum coming into your heart, your life, your car, your home, uh, wherever you're tuning in, just thanking you once again for allowing me to speak into your life. In a few moments, I'm going to be starting a series that I, uh, that I began really um, a few weeks ago in our home church over at Sweet Pilgrim. I entitled it at that point, The Kingdom of God is at Hand. In this entire series, I'm entitling simply God's Kingdom. And I really believe with all of my heart that the people of God need to have a greater understanding of God's kingdom. Some of the things that I'm going to be sharing, they may not be new to you, but then again, some of the things are going to require you to put on your, your student's cap, if you will, and allow the word of God to instill in you the principles of God's kingdom so that you could be better equipped for it and also so that you would be able to be that citizen of the kingdom who is always victorious no matter what's going on. And so in a few seconds, I'm going to be starting this series that I'm entitling God's Kingdom. Now, because I want you to understand these important truths, it's imperative. And I just said, I want you to put on your teaching, uh, your student cap. But I want you to settle your heart into a teaching position so that these biblical concepts can benefit you as God intends. I said during the uh, service a few weeks ago that, the, that there is, I believe, a void in the body of Christ for sound biblical teaching. And I'm not saying that this is true with every church, every pastor, every, uh, every citizen of the kingdom. But I do know this that many people who profess Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, they really go no deeper than what they might be getting on a Sunday morning. And then they live the rest of the week without the biblical principles needed to keep them stable during the times of trouble and the times of war. And so if you have your heart in a teaching position, these biblical concepts are going to benefit you in the way that God wants them to. Now, seeing this as well, by you tuning in and by you saying, I'm going to listen, I'm going to listen with the intent of obeying the truth of God's word. I believe with all of my heart that God is causing this hunger for knowledge in your heart. And I believe that he is going to bring you to a place where you will not perish because you do not lack knowledge. Remember, the book of Hosea says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. But you, because you are allowing your life to line up with the word, the will, and the plan, and the purpose of God, you're going to excel even when you're in the midst of negative circumstances. Now, the good part about these teachings, because like I said, I'm going to be sharing a lot. It's going to be compacted. I've already got about six weeks or so of the teachings done. And so I know that this is going to be line upon line so that you will not be able to refute some of the things that I say, you know, that's based on scripture. Now, the thing is this, if I say something and there is no biblical backing for it, you have every right to put it on the shelf and say, okay, I don't understand that. I'm going to have to come back and revisit it. However, if what I'm saying is true, you have to pray that the spirit of the living God, who is what I'm referring to throughout this series as the administrator of the kingdom of God in the earth, you're going to allow him to bring these truths to pass in your life. Okay, so now with these things said, I begin this important series on, as I said, God's kingdom. Now, although we have heard about heaven, and when we got saved, we began hearing about a kingdom. Many believers, however, have not grasped the power that God released in them, because where God's kingdom is, you will also find his power at work. Now, this power of God is the ability to save. We know that. It's the ability to heal to deliver, to set free, to change you into the image of Jesus Christ, and also to ensure that you enjoy the benefits of the kingdom of God that the Lord intends. Now, to be clear, scripturally, there are two kingdoms identified. There is God's kingdom and the kingdom of darkness. 
over whom Satan is the ruler. Now, I have to make certain that I'm making this clear, and I'll be saying it throughout the teaching. Now, when we look at Satan's kingdom, I do not want to magnify this. I'm not going to talk a lot about that kingdom, but I do want you to know that God's kingdom has demolished the authority of the kingdom of darkness, even though the kingdom of darkness is still rampant in the earth. Now, as we approach this teaching, you must know this about God's kingdom. Although God only has one kingdom, and I have to make certain that I'm putting emphasis on this. Although God only has one kingdom, this kingdom has two components. It's not two kingdoms. It's one kingdom. And the two components, and, we'll, and I'll be explaining this as we progress throughout the teaching, the two components is this. There is the kingdom of heaven, and there is the kingdom of God. And so you're clear in your understanding. As I said, I'm going to be repeating this throughout because your knowledge of this it's going to allow you to operate in the earth as the victorious believer as God intends. Now, today I want to bring your attention to a scripture that is familiar to many of us. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation and then revisit it after I lay a foundation for you to consider. In Luke chapter 17 and verse 20, it says, one day, the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus replied, the kingdom of God, please hear this, it cannot be detected by visible signs. Okay, and I'll say it again. Jesus replied, the kingdom of God, specifically God, can't be detected by visible signs. The New Living Translation goes on to uh, reveal verse 21 is saying, you won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there. For the kingdom of God is already among you. Now, we're going to look at that in a different translation in a few seconds. Now, in the book of Mark, chapter 1, in a similar manner, Jesus shared a message that resounds today and requires our undivided attention. In verse 14 of Mark chapter 1, it says, now after John was put in prison, now John, this is the one who is referred to as John the Baptist, and he's referred to John the Baptist because he was the baptizer who baptized the people into, you know, or I should say baptized them in order that they would have a realization of a greater kingdom. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, as we search these two scriptures in book of Luke chapter 17 and book of Mark chapter 1, you will see differences. One will be about the kingdom of God, as I just read. However, another reference is made that reveals the fact that there is a kingdom of heaven. And that's when the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Nope. The kingdom of God is not so much coming as it is already a reality in the hearts, the minds, and the lives of the people who have made Jesus Christ Lord and are citizens of the kingdom. And when Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he was referring to the heavenly kingdom. And as the Pharisees was asking Jesus about this particular aspect of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven at that point, and we're going to see other scriptures to validate this, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. Why? because the kingdom of God is already among you. And then he says in verse 15 of Mark chapter 1, the kingdom of God is at hand. And so it's important that I explain the fact that these two references to God's kingdom, it does not mean that there are two kingdoms, but it has two manifestations. 
And I will lay this brief foundation, and then we will be looking at them as we progress in the coming weeks. Now, in the scriptures I read, we see that Jesus referred to the kingdom of God. But in the Gospels, you will also see that he refers to the kingdom of heaven. Specifically, looking at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus said it this way. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, kingdom of God, we just saw the book of Luke, the book of Mark. Here in the book of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is referring to the kingdom of heaven. Now, these two references, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, will be the perspective that I'm going to be approaching this teaching from. And the reason is it's often said that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably in the scriptures. And although it refers to one kingdom, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, one kingdom with Lord Jesus Christ over both of them and God the Father as supreme ruler, although it refers to this one kingdom, the references are made to two, please hear this, distinct manifestations of the one kingdom. Now, I want to be certain that this is not misunderstood. The kingdom of heaven is a literal geographical place where God the Father and now God the Son resides because now Jesus, as we read in the New Testament, is seated at the right hand of the Father, having defeated principalities, powers, and every evil entity, as the scriptures have said. Now, it is described in detail. Um, what is described? The kingdom of heaven described in detail, especially in the book of Revelation, where we see, where we will look at this in the coming weeks, as I shared those specific scriptures, talks about streets made of gold, you know, gates of pearls, and, you know, and it goes on talking about how the lamb is the one seated at the throne, and worship is going on, that's the kingdom of heaven, that's going on right now, that's a reality that's happening, even as you're listening to this. However, we have the reflection of the nature of the kingdom of heaven in the earth, which is referred to as the kingdom of God. And this is why the kingdom of God is to be a reflection, now please hear it, of the nature of the kingdom of heaven. And this is why I spent so much time over the last 30, 35 years sharing about the importance of developing God's character, because it's the character that you have that reveals the nature of the kingdom that you represent. Now, the kingdom of heaven, as I said, it's a literal place. God the Father, God the Son is there. Worship is going on. Those, the spirits of those who pass in the earth are now, you know, are, are there worshiping and praising and living as God intends. But now we have the kingdom of God, which is a spiritual kingdom. Now, please hear this, that manifests itself in the earth through the people of God. If you are a believer, you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. What God is trying to do is get his kingdom manifested in the earth through you and me as his sons and daughters. Now, this kingdom of God is to emulate, imitate, or match the place where God the Father and God the Son resides. What's it supposed to do? It's supposed to emulate. It's supposed to imitate. It's supposed to match the place, the heavenly kingdom, where God the Father and God the Son resides. Now, understanding the kingdom of God empowers you to live as an overcomer in the earth, as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to be looking at both the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God in the coming weeks. And I'm going to identify how they both are to benefit you as a believer, spending more time on the kingdom of God than I am going to be spending on the kingdom of heaven. Why? 
because the kingdom of heaven in your you know uh, uh, your residence there when you finally get there after your purpose and this life is done that's a settled deal but the kingdom of god is something that you are supposed to be living on a day to day basis now in mark chapter 1 again after john was put in prison verse 14 says again jesus came to galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now understand the message. The gospel of the kingdom of God. And say the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he says, repent and believe in the gospel. Now, as Jesus addressed the crowds here, his message was not for prosperity. Isn't that what we hear about? It wasn't about healing. Isn't that what we hear about a lot today? It wasn't about comfort and needing this and needing that. No, Jesus knew that you needed deliverance. He knew that you needed a new car. You knew that you needed a place to live. He knew that you needed somebody to share this life with as a husband or a wife or any other earthly comfort. However, the message was this, the gospel of the kingdom of God, which he said is at hand. You see, when we get the message right, we're going to have the benefits that that message is referring to. I'll say it again. When we get the message right, we as the people of God are going to receive the benefits that that message is referring to. And I'm going to explain how important that message is. It's more than getting saved. It's more than just salvation. And so Jesus reveals the fact here that if the kingdom of God is embraced by his followers, that the comforts of earth will be manifested in our lives as part of our kingdom rights and privileges. Now, years ago, we used to call special benefits, you know, uh, we used to call them perks. And you have these special benefits today because you're a child of God and a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, the king over the kingdom that you are part of has guaranteed that he's going to take care of you. But the perks we used to get, we used to get, you know, if we worked real hard in a organization, they may give us a card, they may give us an extra day off, an extra week's pay, or whatever it is. But understand, the company that would give you the perk could only give you what they had access to. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, and we talk about the perks of the kingdom, the perks of the kingdom is unlimited. God can give you anything that he wants. And I'm telling you, the Bible is very clear about the purpose that you have in receiving it. What's the purpose? The purpose is in order that these things that the world seeks after might be added unto you. But to get there, you have a part to play. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, seek first. Now get it, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we're going to be looking at righteousness in a few, in a few weeks. But in his righteousness, in all of these things, what things? The things that he was talking about in the verses prior. He was talking about how people are seeking after these things wealth and, you know, a, a comfort and all these different things. No, he said, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and these things that the world is pursuing, the world is seeking after, they're going to be added to you. You're not going to have to do it. And so this seeking, if you look at this in the Greek text, this seeking means to seek above all other things. Seek above all other things. And this is critical because you cannot be passively seeking the kingdom of God and expect God to add to your life the things that he said. It has to be 
passionate. It has to be unswerving. It has to be persistent. It has to be with patience. You do it, and God is going to ensure that the things that the world seeks after will be added to you, and you're not going to have to fight. You're not going to have to push and pull for it. It will simply become part of your life, but you need to know how it becomes part of your life, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, I'm convinced, before I move on to my next scripture, that many Christians are seeking things that God already said are supposed to be yours. You see, they place a priority on things. They're always looking for more money. They're always, you know, I, I'll put it this way. They're always looking for more money when they don't use the money they got properly. They're looking for healing when they're not lining up how they live, how they eat, exercising, all those things with how the Bible says. And I'm not saying that every sickness, every disease is, is because of something that you did or you didn't do. But please, once we know and once we understand that there is a, a, a problem in our life or a potential problem based on the history of our families, you're obligated to do what you can to ensure not only that you have longevity in your life, but you have a good quality of life. And so there's a balance to kingdom living. And that balance is unlocked, if you will, with the keys to the kingdom of heaven that the Father made available to you. Because look at this. In his conversation with his disciples about who he was, the discourse led to the statement by Peter who said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, in the prior scriptures in Matthew chapter 16, you know, we have Jesus asking, who do people say that I am? Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter releases the fact that he's the Christ. But Jesus replies in verse 17, the New Living Translation says it this way. You are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. Because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. And verse 18, he says, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. The King James says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Then he said something that's important. At verse 19, once you understand that the powers of hell is not going to prevail against you as the ecclesia, the Greek word, the ecclesia of God, those who are called out from among the world and called into the kingdom of God, he says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Now, there's a reason why Jesus gave us keys to the kingdom, telling us that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Because he knew that in the last days, that perilous, unsafe, dangerous, troublesome, trying and wicked times would come. He knew that in these last days, because of these times, that he is going to need citizens who understands what it means to be part of God's kingdom in the earth, and not just living for the heavenly kingdom. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Lord revealed that there will be people in the last days who will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God and will, who will have a form of godliness but deny its power. Therefore, the Lord reserved for himself, and you're going to have to see this. You're going to have to uh, follow this analogy. The Lord reserved for himself men and women in these last days who will not fall into this trap of the enemy. 
He reserved for himself people who are going to place a priority on kingdom living and kingdom expansion. But the only way you can expand the kingdom of God is knowing what the kingdom is and how you're supposed to live when you're there while you live in the earth. You see, the kingdom of God, it's here. It's at our disposal, but we don't know what it is. We don't know how we're supposed to live in the kingdom of God as we live in the earth. And because this becomes a great contradiction, or I'll put it this way, it could appear to be a great contradiction. How can you live in the kingdom of heaven while living in the kingdom of God in the earth? And this is what I'm going to be explaining. You see, changes are happening on a daily basis. The world appears to be getting worse with no end in sight. And unless there is divine intervention, the United States is going to implode as we will not need a foreign entity to bring our demise. Every week, and if it would be known almost every day, we have heartache around the nation. We have pain around the nation, the state and our city as a spirit of terror or a spirit of dread is releasing fear throughout the nation and around the world. There are mass killings while people suffer in silence through a plethora of abusive situations, mental, sexual, physical abuse, and the, the list can be endless. People are crying out for answers to the problems we're facing as escalating prices from baby, baby formula to medicine for our seniors have risen to the point where it's almost impossible to maintain a reasonable lifestyle. Mortgages and food, rent and gas, the majority of the amenities of life have gotten out of control and the residents of earth are demanding answers from men, please hear it, and women who are limited in their ability to rectify what's wrong. I don't care who's in the White House. I don't care who's in the outhouse. I don't care who's in the Congress or the Senate. Men have no full answer to the dilemmas that we're facing. And now with this brief negative narrative, the mental distress that people are facing because of these things cannot be comprehended as everyone is going through and processing these things differently. However, the word of God reveals what's happening. It can be discounted in our lives because it takes spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to see and hear that a special group of people are being released in the earth. And I'm here to tell you, if you're listening to this and you're grabbing hold of it, you're one of those special people. Because this special group of people know that they are residents of the kingdom of God. And although they make up what is known as the quote-unquote Christian church, they are unique in so much as they have applied themselves to study and the application of the word of God so that they can be known as the sons of God. In essence, the tragic circumstances and challenges of life are pains of birth as the world is awaiting the manifestation of the sons of God so it can experience the birth and nature of the kingdom of heaven right here in the earth. And so I'm going to end today with a relevant scripture with an end time meaning that we will see in the earth. And I believe this with all of my heart. The book of Romans chapter eight in the New King James Version it says in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you, re you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the spirit himself, not itself, the spirit is not an it, it's a him, it's a person, 
bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, verse 17 says, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, which means you've got an inheritance. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. Now hear this, which shall be revealed in us. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. This is critical. Uh, the King James translates this verse, verse 19, this way. For the intense or the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Then in verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself, I'm telling you, we're going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption and, and translated into the glorious liberty, the freedom of the children of God. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation, it's groaning and labors with birth pains together until now. And not only that, but we who also have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves, we groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption and re redemption of our body. And for this, verse 24 says, we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does someone still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Now, God promised that things are going to be all right. And we have an inner witness or an inner knowing about this. But when we take our eyes off of Jesus, who the Bible says is the author and the finisher of our faith, we will begin to see things through the eyes of people who have no hope. But you must eagerly and with anticipation wait for the things that God promised as you persevere with hope that what God promised shall be so. Now, I'm going to end here, and I'm going to pick up next week explaining what the earth is going through, the pains of birth as it awaits the manifestation, just like a woman going through pains and labor as she waits for the manifestation of the baby that she's been carrying for nine months. The earth is going through a similar thing. And so what I'm going to do is end here. We'll pick up next week, you know, uh, letting you know that you've been handpicked by God. You have what it takes to not only get through all of this stuff, but you have what it takes to lead others through it as well. And so, my friends, I'm excited to be bringing these truths into your heart, your mind, and your life this day and this week. I pray that you would listen to this again, because this foundation is critical as we, we begin to unfold even greater truths. And so with this said, Pastor David Trainen, thanking you so much for tuning in. Let me know whether or not this is a blessing to you. But also, as I said, keep on your student cap. Let the teachings of the word of God penetrate and break up the fallow ground of your heart. Until then, know that victory is in store. God is bringing you through. And he has great plans for you. God bless you.